So Parliament has finally approved the 2022 budget, but the big question remains, now what? And in fact, today in Parliament, it was drama. And drama that led to several actions being taken that many have said raises serious fundamental constitutional questions. We'll get to those constitutional questions first and then see what really led to this decision. And then the big question about what happens down the line. Let's go through this for you quickly. If you're joining us tonight and haven't followed, this is the place to be. Very quickly, I'm going to run through the next five minutes what you missed. So the minority, the, the parliament has approved, and I'm using parliament, uh, and I'm, it has to be clarified though, because the parliament I'm talking about is the majority side of the house that approved the 2022 budget statement and economic policy. But there are, there are some dynamics here I wanted to pay attention to. What happened last Friday? You have to go to last Friday to understand what happened today. So let's do that because on Friday, 137 members of the N NDC side rejected the 2022 budget. That's Friday, right? So majority at that time, I'm talking about the MPP side, argued that it was unconstitutional and they boycotted. They had started as participants and then they left the chamber before the vote could happen, right? And so that is what happened on Friday. This is the sequence of, of it. And it was a numbers game on Friday. 137 NDC MPs rejected the 2022 budget without the majority side. Flip the script to Monday, uh, to Tuesday today, and you see a similar thing playing out but you interchange the parties and their representatives in parliament. Because what happened today was 138 members, but this is a very important uh, item to consider, which is including the speaker. And this is where bulk of the controversy, the constitutional questions have revolved. We'll come up to that very shortly when we sit down to analyze and have this conversation. They approved the budget, but to approve this, they have to, they have to first consider a vote of rescission, to rescind Friday's decision, to reject it. So that then gets out of the way before they can move into the conversation around how do we consider it. And they did so. But they did so without the minority side. Remember what I said. If you go back to Friday, the Friday proceedings, it was without a majority. Today it was without a minority side who were not in the House. But there were 138 indeed carried, including the speaker. We'll come to that in the constitutional questions that raises. Both sides have described each other's actions as we've seen as unconstitutional. They both say it's a nullity. So if it is, it creates a constitutional crisis. So how do you resolve it? And it all revolves around this particular article here. Um, in fact, the, the, this is a bigger question about the quorum, but there is a more fundamental issue around 104, except as otherwise provided in this constitution, matters in parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members present. And this is very important. Votes of majority of members present and voting with at least half of all members of parliament present. And as we, we have done the calculations for you in terms of the numbers, half will mean 138. So were there 138 members in parliament today? The majority side says absolutely yes. The minority side says you can't have it because the speaker of parliament who was presiding hasn't got a vote and cannot count himself as a member at that time. But there are different interpretations to this that we'll get to very shortly. And so, and if you look at two, the speaker hasn't got a voting right. So when Joe, Joe, Joe Sousu, who was presiding today in the absence of Aban Babwin, put the question, he didn't vote. He didn't vote. And so this is satisfied. But there's a precondition to this, which is you know, at least half of the members of parliament present. If you add him, then you meet the half requirement. If you take him out, you don't. So that's where the conversation has revolved around. Both sides are interpreting this very differently. Um, you know, and they've been, it, this has become a, a, a major topic of constitutional debate. Whether it to go to the Supreme Court for interpretation or not, nobody knows yet. But these are five issues that the finance minister told us today. And if you missed that too, finance minister was on the floor today, delivered um, you know, some form of concessions that they government was willing to do in the meetings with the minority before they're sitting on the floor. Uh, withdrawal of the Japan deal is what the minority had asked. The, the, the finance minister said, listen, this is something we are still negotiating. So let's, let's talk about um, withdrawing it. It doesn't even come up at all. Suspend the 1.75 E levy. That was a major turning point. Both sides could not agree. 
the minority side said, we, they, they won't entertain this, the minority side said, well, we need this to raise revenue. So this is really what led to the breakdown in talks from what we hear. Um, three reconstruct paragraph uh, 829, the minister says, well, we'll do this reconstruction for you. They want a review of the benchmark. There's no clarity on what this is going to happen. Make provision for the Kita tidal wave disaster. In terms of the uh, Blekusu Sea Defense Project, the minister says, well, we commit to do this. Uh, minority says, we want to see it in print, amend the, amend the um, budget for, for this to happen. So on the E-Levy question was a major stalemate. This was really the deal breaker as far as the negotiations before is concerned. And then, of course, we see um, the E-Levy playing out again very significantly in, in the conversation that has happened. So the big question is, so the parliament, they finally approved the budget, which has become one of the tonniest issues in the last one week. Now, now what? My guests are joining me. Um, I have the Deputy Majority Leader, Alexander Afanyo Marking, as my guest, and then we'll have Muntek Mubarak. But we'll start briefly, for the first five minutes, clearing, trying to clear out these constitutional questions and the legal questions that have come up. We'll speak to um, law lecturer, Clara Berry Kassati, who is joining us first. We'll speak to her, clear that up. She will take leave of us, and then I'll speak to the two leaders in the House on all the issues that have come up. Stay with me. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this conversation because I know many of you, like me, were left confused by what happened today. So let's attempt to break it all down for you. The two leaders are with me. I have with me in the studio Alexander Fenyo Marking. He is the deputy majority leader. On the floor, he was on his feet making the legal arguments to support the opposition. Joining me via Zoom right now is the uh, minority Chief Whip, Muntaka Mubarak, who is joining us via Zoom right now. He himself, of course, had addressed a press conference together with Harun Adrisu right after everything played out uh, on the floor. Um, but I want to start first with a quick legal, you know, trying to get a, a neutral position on this legal matter. Because there's a big legal matter that had risen today. The minority side disagree with the majority side on this. And so that's why I invited, and I'm delighted that uh, she, she agreed to join us. Clara Berry Kassati, she's a, a law lecturer with the University of Ghana um, Law Faculty, and she joins us on the telephone, uh, via Zoom, right now. Uh, Clara, thank you for your time here on PM Express. Hello, Clara. Thank you for having me, Evans. Fantastic. Yes, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Let's go thank straight, you for me. Let's go straight sure. to that question. So, the minority side argues that there's a constitutional crisis now because the Speaker of Parliament, in this case, Joe Sousu, who is a member of Parliament, sat as speaker and yet counted himself as part of the MPs to make 138, to form a quorum that, you know, satisfies the precondition for this vote. And that if you, if you discount that, um, this vote shouldn't have carried and that there has been a constitutional breach. Has there? Um, thank you very much, um, Evans. From my reading of um, um, the Constitution, and in this particular case, it is Article 104 of the Constitution. Let me just briefly say what the requirements in Article 104 are. Before I come to that, generally, um, when it comes to having meetings um, and voting at meetings, there are always two issues that the law provides guidance on. One is on quorum, so you have the uh, requirements with respect to quorum, and then the second one is on voting. So you also have the rules as to what, what vote carries and what vote doesn't carry. If you look at Article 104 of the 1992 Constitution, it also makes provisions for these two requirements, um, among other things. And with respect to quorum, it first provides that it should be at least half of all the members of parliament. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, with respect to um, voting, it is about, it, it requires a majority vote of the members present and voting, which means that it would be, if it happens to be the case that just half of the members are present, then it would be the majority of this half present um, and, and voting. Now, there's the, the, I think the confusion comes in as to when it comes to the voting requirement. 
because the voting requirement also provides um, two rules or two requirements. The first one is that one, the speaker does not have a vote, whether original or, or, or casting vote. And that two, where you have equality of votes, it means that the motion has been lost or the vote has been lost. So in other words, if you have a vote and then you have 137 members voting for and 137 members voting against, what it means is that the majority has lost um, um, that vote. On the issue of whether the, the deputy speaker would form part of the quorum, a clear reading of the constitution, and I would rely on two rules, two uh, basic rules of interpretation when it comes to interpreting legal um, um, documents, uh, including constitutions, um, statutes, which is that you must give words their ordinary meaning unless the ordinary meaning um, results in absurdity. And the second issue being that the drafters always intend or the framers intend what they say. If you take these rulings, these requirements, the first question then is, when we say all members of parliament, what do we mean? Mm -hmm. If the deputy speaker is a member of parliament, and of course the deputy speaker is a member of parliament, when it, he, he's part of that all members of parliament. Mm -hmm. So for purposes of quorum, unless expressly denied, what it means is that the, the, the deputy speaker, the, that, that presence would count for forum. Mm. Like I said, the exception is where, for example, if the constitution had provided that the deputy speaker should not be counted uh, in terms of quorum. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of voting, because the deputy uh, member is, 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 is a, a member of parliament, if there was no express requirement in the rules, what it means is that the deputy speaker will have a vote which is the reason why, for example, if you have the speaker present and the speaker was presiding, for example, then the deputy speaker could vote mm -hmm. because there is no bar in uh, Article 104 forbidding the deputy speaker to vote. The bar comes in where the deputy speaker is presiding mm -hmm. because, of course, then the deputy speaker would have stepped into the shoes of the speaker. And in that situation, then, of course, what it means is that whereas expressly mentioned in the constitution and not denied, the deputy speaker's presence would be part of the all members of parliament for purposes of quorum when it comes to the issue of voting because he's of course presiding and at that moment in quotes the speaker, yes, the, the disability expressly mentioned in, in the constitution should attach mm. to, to the deputy speaker when he's presiding. I also take notice of the order 108 of the standing orders of parliament, which also expressly um, do mention that the deputy speaker loses their original vote when they are presiding. Okay, so clearly right? the deputy speaker, and of course the deputy speaker doesn't have any other vote apart from the original vote, which he is entitled to as a member of parliament. So once the deputy speaker loses that vote, unless somewhere else we find the law granting him an express vote, let's say a casting vote, I do not think that the deputy speaker will be able to vote if you read the combined effect of um, or, or, uh, the, or the standing orders, particularly order 108 of the, uh, the orders of parliament in the light of article 104 of the constitution. And bearing in mind that the standing orders of parliament cannot amend the constitution. In the hierarchy of norms in our country, the constitution is the supreme law and any other law, including orders that are found not to be consistent with the constitution, of course, uh, the Supreme Court is entitled to declare them um, null and void to the extent of that inconstituency, th that inconsistency. So this is how um, um, order 108 and article 104 play out in the scheme of, of things. You don't see a constitutional breach with what has happened today? No, I don't see a constitutional breach. Okay. Because, um, um, yes, I don't see a constitutional breach. But I have to, there's a caveat to that. I don't, of course, have the specific numbers. 
So it would depend on the numbers that were present. If so, 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 the, here, so, so, if here the the, so here are the numbers. So here are the numbers. So here are the numbers. There was zero for the M NDC side, and there was one hundred and seventy-six. Um, and these, uh, I'll come to that. I want to break it down for her. 176 first MPs, and then there was independent one, and then there was Joe Weiss, right? So if you put all that together, you have 138 on, on one side, and then zero on the other side, because the NDC side didn't show. Okay. So in terms of the vote, excluding the vote of, of, of the speaker of the day, we would have 137 votes. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And then we would have zero votes. We would have zero votes for the for, others. For the other side. But in terms of quorum, for the other side, but in terms of quorum, if we had 138 percent at the time of the vote, then the quorum requirement would have been met. That including, is if we had include, including, including the speaker in this case, your wife. Including the the, speak, the deputy speaker in this case because the deputy speaker is a member of, of parliament. parliament. Okay, so, so what you're saying is that Joe, all the of so what you're saying that the deputy speaker who counted himself was was constitutionally right in doing so to form the quorum. He was present, yes, yeah. and he's a member of parliament, yes. Okay. So his constituency was present. Okay. At the time that um, um, for purposes of quorum. Okay. But like I said, so that is just one leg of it for purposes of quorum. quorum. For purposes of voting, he was not entitled to vote. And he didn't vote. So again, he was constitutionally right. Yes. If once he didn't vote, he was constitutionally right. He, so if at the end of the vote, we had 137 um, on one side and we had zero on the other side, then of course, uh, the, the rule says that there, it's, it's, it requires majority okay. in this case. Finally, so it would be the, the majority of the 138 percent okay. at the time. Finally, let me ask you also this. You said at the beginning, and the, the rule is very clear, where there's a tie, the vote would have, would, have, would have been lost. So that suggests that if the NDC side had remained in the seat, in their seats, where they are assuming they have all their numbers of 127, 137, um, and this had, the, vote, the question was put by the speaker, who can vote, and assuming all votes, all their numbers voted, we would have had a tie. And that meant that one, the recession would have been lost. And even if you go to the, the, the question about voting for the budget wouldn't have come up at all. Hello, Clara. I think I lost Clara there, very brief. But I think that is, is pretty clear. Um, do I have Clara? Hello, Clara. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we lost there. But I think I want to move on now because that I think that um, basis is very clear because the constitution is clear. Let me bring in uh, Muntak Mubarak on that last point I was asking. Mr. Mubarak, we just had the Clara... Uh, uh, hello, hello, Clara. Hello, Clara. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? I can. I mean, just a quick comment on if the minority side were in the House would, would, and all of them were voting for their respective positions, assuming they did, this better constitution, they would have lost, um, well, the vote would have been lost. The vote for recession of the rejection would have been lost, correct? That is, that is so, because if, assuming that the minority, or they had all their numbers, then we would have had 137 against 137, which is a tie. And the constitution says that if there is a tie, it means that the majority in this case would have lost um, that vote. Okay. So the motion for recession would have been lost. I'm grateful that you join us. Thank you very much for your insights. Let me, let me bring in now um, Afonio Marking and uh, Muntak Mubarak. Muntak Mubarak, to you first. I mean, how do you respond to that last point? That if you had stayed in the house, you would still have had your way today. And what you did on Friday would have stood because the recession would have failed because you bring your 127, 137 to the table. What do you, how do you respond to that? Mr. Mubarak, kindly unmute for me, please. Hello, Mr. Mubarak. Am I, am I, can yes, I be heard yes, now? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Thank you very much. 
Yes, uh, I, like I earlier said, I said before, before I respond to that, I say I'm not a lawyer. Clara is a lawyer, but my use of the standard of the Constitution tells me what she, 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 she read, I disagree with her. Look at Article 104, Evans. Yeah. It's talking about, except otherwise provided in this Constitution, matters in Parliament shall, it didn't say me, shall be determined by the vote of the majority of members present and voting. So it is not just about presence, but voting. So if you cannot vote, can that number be counted? I disagree with her. Because it's talking about members present and voting. So it is not only present, but voting. So a member that is present can vote. So if you cannot vote, how do you how, how can you add that number? And I, I, I agree with her when she said in terms of interpretation or uh, superiority of the the laws, the constitutions are higher than the standard orders. But look at Article 110 of the 1992 Constitution. And uh, permit me to read. Okay. It says, subject to the provision of this Constitution, Parliament may, by standing orders, regulate its own procedure. Uh -huh. When you come to the standing orders, which Parliament has been mandated by the Constitution to be able to, to make these standing orders, when you go to Order 6, sorry, Order, order 7 of our, our standing orders, where he's talking about speaker. He said, speaker or Mr. Speaker includes member presiding at a sitting. Uh -huh. That is a standing order. Saying that when somebody is speaker, it includes a member presiding at a sitting. So when you, when the constitution says that the president doesn't have a vote, as she has a uh, or the standard order 108. It is standard 109, not 108. Yeah. Standard order 108, it clearly states a deputy speaker or any other member presiding shall not retain his original vote while presiding. So when you come, when you combine the effect of whilst presiding cannot vote, and then where it's saying they're present and voting, how do you count that person presiding? Because the moment the person ascends to the seat of the speaker, for the for the decision purposes, for the decision purposes, the person seizes all the opportunities because the person is sitting at a place that is supposed to be independent and neutral mm. in the determinations. Now let me come to the your tentative question about if we were there, yeah, well I've still been able to make a difference. It's so coincidental that I think two days ago or three days ago, I saw a video going around about my struggle with Professor Magakwe, the late, the, the, the then, sorry, the then speaker, where I stood up to draw attention to lack of courage for decision making. And I was, I was ignored completely. One, we picked intelligence. Because they were determined, I mean, in our discussion with them, they were bent on doing everything, whether legitimate or illegal, to resign the decision that took place on Friday. Okay. So we're reliably informed. Mm -hmm. He was going to put the question, and you go blind. Mm -hmm. Evans. And when, because the, you know, the difficulty we have with our standard orders is that when you want to challenge the conduct of Mr. Speaker, you have to come by a substantive motion. So when he pulls the question and he goes blind, so that all of you are standing and you see no call you, what they will do will be that they will take advantage of our number in the chamber to be able to have about 274 reported in the vote and proceedings for tomorrow. That will be more than the required number to take a decision. So in our in our discussion and as part of our strategy, yes, we knew that they were bent on doing this. And the only way they could do it is the speaker will put the question and you go blind and will not call. No matter what you do, he will not call you and you will only have to come with a certain motion. That may take days, but they will take undue advantage of our number. The best is to stay away and be recorded absent so that you can expose 
what they want to do. Okay. And that's exactly what they have done. That's an interesting. Because if we were there, and he refused to recognize us, for us to call for the head count, for counting, we will be in the chamber, and we will be recorded to be present. So in our strategy, we then opted that to be able to make sure that they do not have the number and truly let the world see the kind of persons that they are who opted to stay away. Okay. Just I mean, as on Friday, you know, let me tell you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mubarak, if you don't, if you don't mind. Friday when we're coming. J just a second, you Mr. Mubarak. No, I, I, I'm just saying this briefly. Okay. No, I'm just saying this briefly and then okay. I'll, I'll Okay, okay, sure, sure. On Friday when we're coming, all we wanted to do, because we had proposed the budget, we're to register our 137 and let them have the 138 and have their day. It was just a coincidence that they didn't have 138. Mm. And then before, because they also noticed that they were 137 and they knew that if they stayed and they died, they were going to lose it. They developed, they, they had to get unreasonable excuse to work out during voting time. So as part of their strategy to avoid a loss. So as part of our strategy too, to deny them the opportunity to mm. refuse us to be called and then have our number added to their number for a legitimate number for posterity, we opted to stay away. And if in, 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 I mean, all these things that we are doing, I keep saying that 10 years, 20 years, 100 years from now, anybody who takes their hands up will see that in our case, we had 274 members of parliament present and they lost. In their case, <laughs> Where they said they were rescinding, they were rescinding the decision they, that we took on Friday. They were only 137. Okay. So that was the, that the, was the, the reason why. Okay. We Mr. Mwai, stay with me. Uh, Clara, I know you had an interjection, but stay with me. I'll come to that. I'll come to you briefly for that clarity. But let me bring um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Afunyo Marking. So did you actually have that plan to do what he said to, you know, master them all by the speaker going blind immediately he posed a question? Well, I don't know where Mutaka is, <laughs> is getting this from, but I think they would have to concede that faced with the reality, they knew they could not uh, carry the day and decided on the strategy as he put it. For him to say that uh, he knew Mr. Speaker was going to go blind and would not call them and all that, I think let's leave such a conjecture to the kids. I mean, he's an experienced politician. He's been around for some time. But you see, on a more important matter, we labored all day to have consensus. And I commend the aside for the industry, for the patients, for all of us who work together. Our side too was well represented. And for a moment, we realized that, hey, put all these politics aside and look at Mother Ghana. Mm. So they had proposals, we had ours, we discussed, we said, okay, go and brief your respective caucuses. We did that, we came back. The only thing that we disagreed was the position they took to protect Mr. Speaker. And that is where Muntaka must in good faith let the world know that too. You see, you could see in their eyes that they concede what happened on Friday was an illegality. Their posture. In that meeting. Yes, I mean, obviously. But then when we were done with everything, that our, the positions were clear that, okay, on the e-levy, as a matter of principle, you want a certain percentage. I don't want to mention that. And we are the on 70, a certain... 0 0.5. They mentioned the press conference. 0 0.5. Well, oh, okay. If they... That the least they'll do is one percent. Well, okay. If they've disclosed the content of yeah. our indoor meeting, then fine. So then I'm free to go there. Yeah. So we had said the finance minister was engaging some other stakeholders, and the result of that engagement, if successful, would mean that there was going to be some 0.5 percent. So government is ready to do 1.5, okay. which would be 0.25 percent down, so that when the 0.5% is successful, we could now go around it, and then the consumer will not feel it that much. Again, we drew our colleagues' attention to the fact that... Oh, so the finance that made that... Made, was oh, yes. Made, oh, yes. oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 
we agreed on the Japa that okay, it will be out. The Blekusu C defense phase two, we agreed that immediately, you know, there's always a contingency. If you look at the appendix, there is some contingency provision there. In, in every budget, you have contingency. So we all agreed, okay, we will look there and then find space there to deal with the Blekusu thing so the engineering can start and payment monies will be made available. Then the other things that they asked for were all addressed. So now we're supposed to agree on the text. You see, we come into the floor. We acknowledge that something, you know, out of normal has happened. Let's go and communicate to Ghanaians that as political leaders, we have agreed on this. The text was where we had a problem. We were trying to construct it, construct it there. But I realized that they didn't want Mr. Speaker to be steamed in any steel. They didn't want Mr. Speaker to suffer any dent at all. So it was like, okay, come with this uh, amendment and proceed so that we all vote for these uh, proposed, I mean, this consensus we built on the main budget. And we also said, look, if you contend that indeed you've rejected the budget, you can't place something or nothing. The rule is clear. Eighteen you lose, eighteen you lose. You know, you cannot place something or nothing. So let's not pretend that the budget still exists if we are going by your argument. So I think that is where we had a deadlock. We all agreed. We all agreed that, okay, leader, majority leader and minority leader, together with the speaker, deputy speaker, should construct that text acceptable to us. So we said that we are kids. I mean, one member even raised it that, look, at this point, we are leaving the matter to you, the big men. So the big men amongst us were the three. All right? So we dispersed. The majority leader, the minority leader, and the deputy speaker. Because the deputy speaker who was going to be in the chair was proposing the text. Finally, we gave him that opportunity. I said, you are in. So let us know how you are going to navigate this for safe landing so that we get to the anchorage safely, nobody is hurt and all that. But they will not take anything because they felt that Mr. Speaker was in the chair and he's their party man. You know, uh, Mubarak, when it comes to Speaker, his whole posture changes. You know, <laughs> he's Mr. Speaker. So they didn't want to senior most apostle. What, uh, I'm saying that... Babuin had yes, I mean, presided over. Obviously, what happened on Friday was an illegality. According no to question you, they, dis they disagree Listen, with you. listen, listen. No question about that. Would they know? Mr. Speaker himself said that 137 were in the chamber. He himself said so. Now I've heard Mubarak talking about uh, the fact that, oh, outside we were in parliament initially and the vote will bear uh, the, the uh, attendance, yes, yes, which yes. is in the vote, yes, yes, will yes. bear him out. But you see, what he has forgotten, that time and again we've had rulings in the chamber that if you are in the chamber, even if you come to parliament, you go and register, you go to committee meeting, you don't come to the house floor, you are deemed to have been absent. He knows that. He knows that. So if you now come to the constitution, and we are talking about members present, my sister Clara did as good by drawing attention to the rule of interpretation what the framers had intended, language used must first be given their ordinary meaning, unless there's some sort of absurdity. So if you look at the, 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 the language of the Constitution and the standing orders, obviously, if they are taking a vote in the chamber and you are unavoidably absent by reason of some official engagement, you can count yourself as being present merely because earlier, uh, uh, earlier in the day, you were present, and you signed off, and you left. I mean, they, they tried to hold on to straw with respect to that argument. But listen, it's over. I told him this evening that we, tomorrow we must have our interior and chocolate and laugh over these things. Ghana first. All the uncertainty is cleared. I don't think this thing uh, is cast in iron and stone. We are done. Let's leave the rest of the debate 
to constitutional law students. As politicians, we are the masters of our own rules in the chamber. What is important is that the government needed its budget. What again was important was for the government to listen to the concerns of the minority. Mm. On record, the government has listened to them. The issues that were thorny can still be litigated, debated, because you see, We've just agreed on a policy. But there's a procedural concern they raise. You, but if you say you've agreed, then if, you may change it. Evans, include it. Evans, wait. I will explain. Amend the budget. Evans, no, that's not how it operates. I that's that's, that's the argument. No, no, they, they are, I disagree with them. I won't say they are wrong. I disagree. Let me tell you. This e-levy, there's going to be an e-levy bill. You know that? Yes. It's not a matter of government has approved a levy. We have agreed on the policy. Now, government will come with the bill. In that bill, we'll go clause by clause. And that is where the extended stakeholder consultation engagement will again come up. We'll look at certain provisions and then deal with some of the very concerns. So we're telling them that let us finish with the policy. But I have a question for you. Please ask me. If Parliament approves the budget statement, the policy, it would approve the 1.75. How do you come back to reduce it, it to 1.5? It, 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 it happens all the time. No, but I just Check the last answer. question. Check, no. How do you come back to reduce one point when that parliament has approved 1.75? Evans, Evans, check the records of parliament. In the NDC time, MPP time, you mean the politics of this you country. You can vary what parliament has approved without coming when, recourse back Where to it reduces into an enactment, it is like... Government announcing a policy. Yeah. That policy would have to be executed, implemented. The implementation process may require legislation. So it is when you come to the legislation that you fine tune it. All right? Mm. That is why you have to receive memoranda from the public. Like the special prosecutor. But you do that before you read the, the statement, the budget. Wait. The special prosecutor bill, for instance. It came. The first text that came, all inputs, all manner of input were made. There were a lot of consultations, public memoranda, and eventually the committee came with this report. And even that, we still did amendment. So I am saying mm. that the mere fact that we have approved of the policy, which policy is talking about government intention to at least look at 1.75. When it comes to the proper law, to give government the power to take that levy, all issues, including the discussions we had today, at least, if for nothing at all, we, in real terms, when it gets to the bill, we know that government has shifted from 1.75 to 1.5. So you expect that the bill reflect this change? I am saying that at least okay. from the discussions we had today, government has shifted, all right? And I'm saying that they shouldn't be too worried that, oh, if today is over, then the doors are shut. Yeah. Listen, we are all Ghanaians in Ghana here. We all use Momo. It is not about MPP people who would not benefit and NDC people will benefit, or this levy is going to be imposed on NDCs. They also had an issue with the threshold of 500 Ghana, and then they shifted to 300. All right, they shifted to 300. So they wanted a threshold of 500, not no, 100. No, no, they, no, they wanted it to come to, they first said 500. Okay, so and they later reduced the budget to, says 100. So yes, they wanted to lift it they, to 500. And then they came later down to when we, upon negotiations, they Did came you to also 300. Move from 100? We were not comfortable with, with that. the 300. So you stayed but, with 100. But I'm sure government will look at those, those concerns. I want Ghanaians to know that it isn't the case that the MPP government has shut its doors on the opposition. Okay. Frankly, we have been engaging. Listen, Mubarak... Briefly, Mali, because I want, yes, to I, want, I want to... I want to end on this point. You see, since last week, we were engaging each other. Speaker called us into a meeting. Whilst there, he knows. His backbenchers came to disrupt the meeting. Sometimes they're unable to control their backbenchers. Or for Rata, He's been accused for failure to engage. He doesn't engage and all that. He came to speaker. Leadership were at the speaker's block, having a meeting with the speaker. 
their backbenchers again came in to attack that meeting. Banging at the door, shouting that we want to go and start. He knows it, but he won't talk about it. This Friday. I, last Friday, he knows it. And at a point, Mr. Speaker himself was held hostage. You know, when we were finally fine-tuning the thing, then somebody brought him to the speaker's uh, lobby to show him something on, the, on, on, on his phone. That, so that's what he said on the floor. That uh, yeah, that uh, Facebook, uh, 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 social Kevin Taylor. No, no, I want to quote what Mr. Speaker said. That Kevin Taylor is insulting him. That he is deliberately delaying for government to have its way. So at a point, Mr. Speaker also became helpless. When on the floor, we left, and Mr. Speaker wanted to adjourn, adjourn this house. They started yelling at him. They started talking. They started using abusive words. So they themselves put Mr. Speaker in that situation he found himself. Okay, so stay with me. Let me bring him. Mr. Mubarak, is this really what transpired, that government made these concessions and the text was about to be written, but you still didn't agree to a reduction? Is that what really happened? Well, if I, if I, let me say that uh, I'm happy that uh, U.S. were asking him that if you had agreed on some uh, concessions, now you you refuse to amend the budget or the the test of the budget. Then what kind of concession? What kind of agreement is that? Let me admit, when we're starting the negotiation, in fact, I stated nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So let me say here and now. Because not at all was, I mean, everything is not agreed. Nothing was agreed. On top of our negotiation was the e-levy. And we insisted, and we showed them the paragraph in the budget, where, like you yourself rightly mentioned, the 1.75 is stated. And we are saying that, how do you go back without amending that test? And we said, the neatest way to do this was that the things that we've agreed, can you put them into writing? Place it on this budget that was rejected on Friday. Relay it. If you relay it with a new motion, what we'll do is that to be able to hold each other's hand and do it together, we will stand the orders of the House down for this long uh, debate before approval. And then we'll approve it. Because then we are building consensus. And you see, it's funny that he's saying that, oh, we're trying to protect the speaker. They were protecting their ego. And you remember I said it, I said it there. I said, you see, the problem you're having is that you have an ego that you want to protect. And you also want to have a budget that is said that both of us approve it. You can't have both. You have to choose one. Put your ego aside that you knew on Friday you lost. That's why you ran out at the time of voting. So your budget just got sunk. But we are trying to salvage it. And we are willing to do it together. Mm. But this agreement that we have, can we amend the test to reflect that so that we can relay the budget and get it approved today? They said no. Then now he is talking about, oh, who are trying to protect Mr. Speaker? Please, that is far from that. All we're saying is that we took a decision on Friday. You brought the budget. You ran away and left your budget. So because you ran away and left your budget, that's why what happened to your budget happened. So don't blame innocent speaker. But if you were there with your 138, definitely there's no way 137 can beat 138. But you ran away and left your budget. And then too, he was making some assertion. Even you saw the video that you were showing, even once we were talking. Yes. There's no doubt in anybody's mind watching us on the floor. Which of the side has control over his backbench? Because a backbencher, with a greater respect, with all humility, when I came to the house as a first timer, obviously, even after four years, I wasn't so much conversant with the standard orders. But there are a lot of backbencher who I'm very sure he hasn't even read up to 10, page, 10 pages of the standard orders to come and match them out. A backbencher, you saw that when we business speaker and came back. When we went for that meeting and came back, if you had the video, just check. There were almost some pandemonium on our side. I went back with my deputy, we were able to tame it and calm it. We were in full control of our caucus. 
Yes, obviously. <laughs> People were agitated on that day. Because you remember we all said uh, that partner we were sitting at 10 o'clock. Yes. And as at 1 o'clock, we hadn't sat. We came, speaker came and said the majority had asked for 30 minutes. The 30 minutes became almost three hours. So they were losing patience. And when the finance minister came and said he wanted to engage the our focus, I told him in that meeting, I said, you are not in that meeting. You were not there. It was your whip, myself, your leader, and my leader, and my deputy leader who were there. You were not there. And then the finance minister, I told the finance minister, Mr. Minister, my focus is very, very agitated because we'll be here since by nine o'clock who were ready. And people were losing patience. Mm. It will not be advisable. Whatever there is, let's discuss it here. When you come to the floor, make those concessions on the floor. When the speaker gave him the opportunity, if I go and look at the video, the finance minister failed to make those concessions. He then on their floor said that he will get time to come and engage us. Something that I have told him in that meeting that it wasn't possible. Mm. And that was why the speaker said, okay, then let me leave it to the house to take a to decision. Decide. But let me ask you and today. You have in your mind, today, is it true that the finance minister... Is it true that the finance minister was willing to reduce the uh, levy from 1.75 to 1.5? Yes, that's a fact. But we insisted that, look, this was a, a, a levy that we had consistently been saying that withdraw, do broader consultation, bring the bill so that we can even see the content of the bill, be sure of what is in it before it is passed. So for you to stay, you made a concession by moving from 1.75 to 1.5, for us, it's no concession at all. And because of that, we couldn't agree. Okay. And then it came to the budget where we were saying that simply relay with the amendments of the other things that we've agreed so that we could do it together. And that we couldn't agree. And based on the, the understanding of the negotiations, until everything is agreed, nothing is agreed, nothing was agreed. Interesting. So, I mean, the, the big question then becomes... <laughs> The big question then becomes, what now? Because as, as it stands now, uh, the budget has been approved. What now? Because there's still a lot more work to do before all the appropriations, etc., the committee work will happen. I'll ask both of you that question, and then we'll wrap up. But let me give a quick uh, two minutes to Clara uh, to wrap up for me on that question we started with. Clara, you have a quick um, uh, additional point to make on this very interesting point that both sides disagree on. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think I, I just wanted to read um, clearly um, the exact words of Article 104. And so if I may read, it says that except as otherwise provided in, the, in this constitution, matters in parliament shall be determined by the votes of the majority of members present and voting with at least half of all the members of parliament present. Mm -hmm. The emphasis here is with at least half of all the members of parliament present. That is what constitutes the quorum. Mm -hmm. So the quorum here is at least half of all the members of parliament present, and there's a full stop um, from that. And the second thing is when the law says, except as otherwise provided in this constitution or subject to this constitution, as the honorable member read with respect to Article 10, 110, what it means is that Whatever follows, if there's anything contrary to somewhere else in any other documents, it doesn't follow. So in other words, the standing orders stand unless they, there is something that is not consistent in them with the constitution. So the standing orders, yes, parliament is able, uh, has been given the right to regulate its own rules, but is still subject to, to the constitution. In other words, everything in the standing orders must be consistent with the constitution, otherwise they fail. That, 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 that is the law that we operate at the moment. So I just wanted to point okay. um, that out. That's a very important point. Yes. Thank you very much. Let me quickly bring, bring, bring uh, Mr. Fanyo marking in on that last question I said I will ask, which is very important. So the budget has been approved. You had your way eventually. What now? Because well now we're going to do deal with the estimates, mm -hmm. so that's the next step. We expect to be re receiving the estimate from the various ministries and agencies, and the committees will start their work. They eventually, deal with the appropriation, and then any government business that will come before the house. You expect cooperation from your others, from the from your colleagues. Well, you see, 
<laughs> you should know how we behave as politicians. We we are like twins. Mm. You may see us fighting. If you join and you want to do anything, you become a third person, you know. Okay. So you expect cooperation? Ah, we are there to work together. Mutakai would be angry today. Tomorrow you'll be happy. I'll be angry today. Tomorrow I'm happy. I mean, disagreements are part of our bona fides as MPs in that chamber. Mm. All right? So why not? I mean, let them disagree today. And tomorrow we have government business to do. We have to get going. Let me ask you, for, for me and for those who've watched The Citizens, do you then expect that when the bill, for example, comes for, to actualize the levy, we will see a 1.5 and not 1.75? You see, when the bill comes, whichever form it takes by way of the threshold and the, the percentage, mm -hmm. members at the committee level will have an opportunity to make input. But that's a commitment that has already been made. Yes, and I'm today. saying that... And I'm saying that mm -hmm. But so we, we shouldn't expect we, 1.75, right? We can even get it better. So you you it can actually because go if, down if what if what the minister said becomes actualized, if he's successful in the negotiation he's doing, which negotiation he mentioned to us, then we should expect something more. Uh, Mr. Mubarak, so what happens now from the majority side? There's a lot more work. In fact, now the work really begins on the budget. Uh, estimates, committee works, it has to come back. What, what, what should we expect? Ivan, I told them, I, I, I told them, and I remember, if my colleague, I will remember, I told them, we had an opportunity to deal with the issue once and for all, so that we may have a very smooth sale, unless maybe something unexpectedly, I mean, comes up to appropriation. But failure to have an agreement will mean that this will chase us all the way to appropriation. And I'm not conjecturing, I'm not threatening, but definitely they should expect us to be voting on almost every aspect. On almost every decision we have to be voting. Because now they've showed us that Members present, members present must at least be 138. They must make sure that they leave ministries to come and sit so that they can have that minimum to conduct government business. That we are assuring them. At least in this meeting, they will have to know they have set a bad precedent. And that bad precedent, we hope tomorrow when it catches up with them, they will not cry foul. They will stick to it and where they fall on its sword, they will bear it and agree that they were those who pulled the dagger first. And for us, like I said, where we disagree, we will make it known, and we have always done. And our hope and prayer is not to topple a government or to topple its business. But now that they've shown the way, we can assure them they should do well to make sure that they are always there to at least be able to have the minimum uh, to conduct government business in the chamber. I'm, so that's all I will say for now uh, and hope that we'll be able to have Christmas early. <laughs> I like that. Tomorrow, um, the chocolate. I'm told you like chocolate. He likes coffee. Brother, you know, he's, so, he's one person who cannot pretend, you know. Yeah. I love his sincerity and his approach in politics. Yeah. But he's, he's also forgiving. For, for what? What does he mean? No, no. Mubarak is very forgiving. Oh, he gives he forgives. He, he, yes, okay. I mean okay. the holy the holy book. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course uh, that we, I mean, we he's already talked about. He's a Muslim, but he's looking forward to Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Mumtaka Mubarak. Oh. They were happy on Friday. <laughs> Christmas come early for them. Uh, Mr. Mubarak, always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fanyo Marking. All the best tomorrow, and Clara also for the uh, legal education. Enjoy the rest of the day.